Wangwanani Muria Africa and welcome to Africa Good Morning on this lovely Friday morning. We finally made it to Friday. Now Africa Good Morning brings you the latest news happening on the African continent and beyond. You're joined by Diana Master and Glenora Shipura. Good morning, Glen. Good morning. How are you? I am doing well because it's a Friday. Well, I want to know, have you finally forgiven me? No. I bought you breakfast. I could never forgive. The thing is, you buy me breakfast and you missing my birthday dinner. It doesn't, because you see, I, I, I hold grudges. Well, well, good thing today is conflict resolution day. <laughs> I mean, it is conflict resolution day, but it's not a conflict if I've already decided that I'm mad at you. you well, get it? conflict resolution day is aimed is a global event n intended to promote the concept of peaceful conflict resolution created in 2005 by the Association for Conflict Resolution. It is now an annual celebration, meaning you have to forgive me. No. Nope. Let's take a look at, the, at this video on World Conflict Resolution Day. Getting right into our top stories, 40 hashtag and SARS protesters languishing in jail two years after protests. Nigeria witnessed one of the biggest demonstrations in its history in October 2020 when youth marched through the streets and major roads in the country in a protest against brutalities by the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, a unit of the Nigeria Police Force which is now disbanded. They were, however, ended abruptly after some of the protesters were allegedly killed at the Lekki toll gate on October 20, 2022. Two years on after the incident, organizers and victims of the NSARS protests are calling for full implementation of the reports of the judicial panels of inquiry set up by the government to probe the protests. Now, according to Amnesty International, vast majority of hashtag NSARS protesters arrested in October 2020 are still being arbitrarily detained without trial. Now, the fact that nobody has been brought to justice over the torture and killings of hashtag NSARS protesters is a stain on Nigeria's human rights records. The authorities must ensure that suspected perpetrators of the deadly crackdown on hashtag and SARS protesters are brought to justice in fair trials and address impunity for police brutality, said Osai Ojigoho, director of Amnesty International Nigeria. Moving right along, Central African Republic's top court head refuses to retire. The head of Central African Republic's top court, which has stymied a push to enable President Faustine Ashange Twadera to keep running for office, has defied a government order to retire. The Constitutional Court last month annulled a commission for proposed reforms that would let Twadera, who is 65 years of age, stand for a third presidential poll in line with a trend in some parts of Africa that opponents see as creeping autocracy. The already twice elected Twadera's government earlier this month issued a decree telling 28 higher education officials born between 1946 and 1955 to retire from December 31st. On that list was Constitutional Court President Daniel Dalan, a 70-year-old lawyer, jurist and former university professor appointed president in 2017. But in a letter to the government on Wednesday, she noted that constitutional judges serve a seven-year mandate that cannot be ended without the court's consent. The vast but sparsely populated nation of about 5 million people is one of the world's poorest despite its potential wealth from diamonds, timber and gold. It has suffered violence since 2013 when mainly Muslim Seleka rebels ousted then-President Francois Aziz, prompting reprisals from mostly Christian militias with one million people uprooted since. Moving over to East Africa in some rather interesting developments. Electric bus debuts in Nairobi in clean energy push. Now a Nairobi-based green transport company unveiled on Wednesday an electric bus. 
Nairobi is referred to as the green city in the sun because of lush parks surrounding the East African capital, Rome. A Kenyan-Swedish company now wants that epithet to also refer to the city's environmentally friendly mobility. It unveiled on Wednesday an electric bus in a city where polluting exhaust forms contribute to a thick smog. It's the first electric mass transit bus in Kenya that we designed since last year and co-manufactured it with a global partner, Denise Wakaba exclaimed. Now the brightly painted bus pulled out into the notorious morning traffic in the city of nearly 5 million, which lacks a state-run transport network. Most commuter transport is privately operated in Nairobi, and Rome said fares on the electric bus would rival those offered by its smogier competitors if only one charging station exists in the metropolis, metropolis of nearly 5 million. The team Rome was not deterred. Now, in our next story, WHO's Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus narrows, says narrow window to prevent genocide in Ethiopia. World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said on Wednesday there was a very narrow window now to prevent genocide in his home region of Tigray in northern Ethiopia. Tedros, who previously served as Ethiopia's health minister and foreign affairs minister, has been sharply critical of Ethiopian authorities throughout the two-year war. The government has in turn accused him of trying to procure arms and diplomatic backing for rebel forces charges he has denied. In his sharpest comments on the war yet, Tedros told reporters in Geneva that food and healthcare were being used as weapons of war in Tigray, which is largely cut off from outside world. There's no other situation globally in which 6 million people have been kept under siege for almost two years, Tedros said. There's a, narrow, there's a very narrow window now to prevent genocide. Ethiopian government spokesperson Legis Tulu Redwan Hussein, the national security advisor to the prime minister and the prime minister spokesperson Bilense Yum did not immediately respond to requests for comment. The Ethiopian government has repeatedly denied blocking humanitarian supplies to Degray or targeting civilians. The conflict has killed thousands, displaced millions and left hundreds of thousands on the brink of famine. Sanctions that America imposed on Zimbabwe have long divided opinion. Now the U.S. calls them punitive measures against a government that disregards human rights, but Harare calls them a method of forcing regime change in a way that affects the masses. Under President Emerson Unangagwa, calls for the removal of the sanctions have been elevated to regional and international levels through the Southern African Development Community and the African Union. Now, Zimbabwe's biggest trade partner, South Africa, has lent its voice against the sanctions. In September this year, President Cyril Ramaphosa told his American counterpart, Joe Biden, that the sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe had a spillover effect on other economies in Southern Africa and that they should be removed. Senegalese President and African Union Chairperson Makisal also spoke against the sanctions. In 2019, the Munangawa regime hired two, years lo two U.S. lobby firms, Avenue Strategies and the Ballard Group, to end Zimbabwe's international isolation, but without luck. On 25 October, Zimbabwe will lead Anti-Sanctions Day, a resolution by SADC in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, at the 39th SADC Summit. Cities across the SADC region will engage in activities such as marches and music shows to denounce the sanctions. And now bringing us to the end of our top stories, Liz Truss resigns after six weeks as UK Prime Minister. Britain's Liz Truss battled to retain her grip on power on Thursday, a day after she lost a second top minister in open arguments and jostling among her lawmakers in Parliament highlighted a breakdown of party unity and discipline. In just six weeks as Prime Minister, Truss has been forced to abandon almost all of her policy program after it triggered a bond market route and collapse of her approval ratings and those of a Conservative Party. Since last Friday, she has lost two of the four most senior ministers in government sat expressionless in Parliament as her new finance minister ripped up her economic plans and faced howls of laughter as she tried to defend her record. We can't go on like this, one Conservative lawmaker told Reuters late on Wednesday of the chaotic scenes in Parliament. The sight of yet another unpopular Prime Minister clinging to power underscores just how volatile British politics has become since the 2016 vote to leave the European Union unleashed a battle for the direction of the country. Truss became Britain's fourth Prime Minister in six years after being selected in September to lead the Conservative Party by its members, not the broader electorate, and with support from only around a third of the party's lawmakers. She promised tax cuts funded by borrowing, deregulation, and a sharp shift to the right on cultural and social issues. Her abrupt loss of authority comes as the economy heads into recession, and her new Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt races to find tens of billions of pounds of spending cuts to reassure investors who took fright at Truss's policy proposals.
Now, Liz Truss said on Thursday she would resign as British Prime Minister, brought down just six weeks into the job by an economic program that shattered investor confidence and enraged much of her Conservative Party. Speaking outside the door for Number 10 Downing Street office, Truss accepted that she had lost the faith of her party and said she would step down next week, becoming the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. Now, police in Lusaka have arrested a girl aged 19 for faking an abduction to spend time with her boyfriend. This story and more right after the break. Careers Bistro focuses on the movers and shakers in the corporate world. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact zone at synergy.com.na. It's now time for us to take a quick trip to Zambia to speak to Mike Sichula to give us the latest news on the ground. Good morning, Mr. Sichula. Africa, good morning. A very good morning it is indeed. Now starting off, police in Lusaka have arrested a girl aged 19 years for faking an abduction to spend time with her boyfriend. Could you please get into the story? Yes. One of those stories that are of uh, public interest because the incident comes barely uh, a week or so where police retreat between girls who are abducted. So in this case, this girl uh, did show a uh, family uh, on last week on Sunday that uh, she had been abducted as well by unknown people. But apparently, when police instituted investigations, it was discovered that uh, she was never abducted, but she had agreed with her boyfriend to go to a, a boyfriend's place and spend time there. So when she was there, she they made some calls to family members to say that I've been abducted, and the abductors are demanding for 50,000 kwacha, which is close to 4,000 United States dollars. But uh, this money was not paid. So upon police instituting investigations, they managed to trace uh, where she was at her boyfriend's place, and uh, she was retrieved. And she's now been detained in police, charged with the offense of uh, cheating public officers and also causing an alarm. Because the alarm that she caused is that uh, she told her uh, relatives that uh, she was abducted and uh, dumped in a one-room house with 10 other girls, a matter which is actually false. Wow. Very controversial indeed. indeed. Yes. Getting into your next story, the election of two parliamentarians has gone ahead despite of a court judgment ordering the election to be put on hold. What's going on there? Yes, uh, there were two parliamentary uh, uh, seats that were identified by the courts. And uh, the, the, the immediate first members of parliament had gone to court, and this belonged to the, the patriotic funds, the, the former ruling party. So they went to court, and the court they had ruled that uh, the, must, the election must not be held until this matter is resolved. But uh, the Electoral Commission of Zambia has decided to go ahead with the polls which are going on today because in between, there has been a lot of uh, court uh, proceedings that have, have, have happened. Uh, the, another court on the other side, the court has ruled that uh, the 21 days under which the matter that was before it uh, to be considered had elapsed. Hence, it is uh, okay for the Electoral Commission of Zambia to go ahead with the elections. But the other party are also arguing to say there is no no, the elections could go ahead when the High Court had, uh, had, uh, had put in a stay to the elections. So this is something that uh, is likely to cause an uproar as uh, the, the, 
turn out to be coming by the end of today or in the next two days, where voters in Kabushi and Kwacha constituencies on the Copper Belt province will be electing new members of parliament. So one of the casualties in this case is the former Foreign Affairs Minister Joseph Malangi, whose seat in Kwacha was nullified on account that he did not have a grade 12 certificate. So it is something that uh, it is likely to have a long legal battle uh, once the election will be determined uh, between today and tomorrow. Of course, we'll be waiting for an update from you on this story. Moving right along, President Hakainde Hichilema has called for the speedy completion of projects to avoid the country from losing money, which could be channeled into other developmental projects. Could you please tell us about this? Yes, the president was speaking when he met students who welcomed him at the Copper Belt University grounds uh, when he went to the Copper Belt to, on a state, on a uh, official visit. So the president has assured uh, the students that the government will continue uplifting their welfare because he believes once projects, the project that he was touring is uh, hostels as well as uh, other institutions of learning within the campus. So according to him, he says delayed completion of our projects is adding added costs on uh, the, 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 the treasury. But uh, this development uh, in terms of uh, with uh, putting on hold construction of projects came about under the past administration who had called, who had put a stop on the on development of projects because the country needed to uh, address the foreign debt. So this is something that the head of state is concerned and uh, it is hoped that uh, his administration will, re will, will ensure that these projects are completed in real time because in Zambia, university students are having a crisis in terms of accommodation. Accommodation is not sufficient for the high number of students that are turning out at higher level institutions. All right, it does sound like a great initiative. Hopefully, it speeds up. <laughs> Getting into the next story, over 250 swimmers will convene in Lusaka this weekend for the season's first swimming league gala. Can you tell us more? Yes, the Zambia uh, Swimming Union says the event will also be used to select the final list of swimmers that will take part in the 2022 CAN Zone 3 Championships to be held in Tanzania next month. So there are a number of uh, young swimmers uh, that have been uh, recruited by the Zambia Swimming Union, and uh, it is the expectation of the union president who said that uh, uh, a provisional squad was selected and the final official list of the 20 swimmers will be released after the gala. So this weekend will be a hive of activity at the Olympic mm -hmm. Youth Development Center, which has got the high tech or one of the modern uh, swimming uh, pools in the country. So mm -hmm. the, the 250 uh, swimmers have been selected from a number of our private and uh, government uh, our schools. And uh, most of these swimmers, some of them uh, hold a lot of medals to their name because of All their right. uh, intensive skills in swimming. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Sichula, for bringing us the latest news on the ground in Zambia. It's now time to take a look at the weather forecast.
this is still Africa. Good morning. We now take a look at our economic news. Ghana shops traders shut down to protest inflation. Traders in Ghana's capital, Accra, closed their stores and businesses on Wednesday in a three-day protest over soaring costs of living as the West African country battles economic fallout from the Ukraine war. Daily gridlock in Accra Central Business District and in the, in the biggest vehicle spare parts district was largely absent with only street food vendors in front of the shuttered shops. President Anna Akafo Ado is under pressure over his economic management after reversi reversing his position and entering talks with the IMF over a three billion US dollar loan to shore up public finances. Ghana faces a high debt load and inflation at a historic high of 37% in September, while the local SEDI currency has plummeted against the US dollar. Kwesi Amoha, a spare parts dealer at Abose Okai, a suburb of Accra, told AFP traders no longer issue pro forma invoices because price change within a day, sometimes within hours. Now, South Africa crypto platforms must be licensed in 2023, and this is according to a regulator. Cryptocurrency financial companies in South Africa will need to apply for a license between June 1st and November 20th, 2023, in order to operate legally, the country's financial conduct regulator said on Thursday. A declaration on Wednesday that crypto assets are financial products does not mean that the illegal tender Eugene Dutoy, head of the financial sector conduct, conduct authorities regulatory frameworks department, said at a press conference. Financial watchdogs around the world have been grappling with how to regulate the growing number of digital cryptocurrencies and tokens, the prices of which have fallen from historic highs reached in November last year. The FCSA deliberately referred to crypto assets rather than cryptocurrencies as regulators do not believe they qualify as currencies, the regulator's head, Unati Kamlana, said. The declaration will enable authorities to tackle scams and protect customers having previously had no power to do so, he said. That brings us to the end of our economic news. Let's take a look at the economic indicators. Now an update on the T20 World Cup, Sri Lanka and Netherlands qualify for Super 12 Aftershock UAE win. But more to tell us about this is Ari Kholkhad with our sports package. Good day everyone, time for international sports news and starting off with cricket news. The ICC Cricket World Cup being played in Australia and uh, the news from the tournament is not good news for Namibia. Unfortunately being knocked out, knocked out in the preliminary rounds, uh, Namibia had to beat the UAE to go through to the next stage of the World Cup and unfortunately lost to the UAE uh, by seven runs. The UAE batted first 148 for the loss of three runs and Namibia scoring 141 for the loss of eight and uh, that means that Sri Lanka Lanka and the Netherlands will go through in that group uh, to the next round of uh, the next phase of the World Cup. Sri Lanka earlier beat Netherlands by 16 runs, uh, so Sri Lanka have having won two games uh, from their three games, and the Netherlands also winning two from their three. It was uh, Namibia that uh, were chasing 149 to win. Uh, they were reeling on 69 for the loss of seven wickets in the 13th over. It was uh, David Visa that did well in the end. He scored 55 from 36 deliveries. Unfortunately, just came out short, and uh, it is. Uh, UAE that win the game by seven runs. On to golf news, uh, that is uh, on the team. And with that, we've come to the end of our program. But before we say goodbye, let's take a look at the highlights from today's broadcast. 
40 hashtag in SARS protesters languishing in jail two years after protest. Central African Republic's top head refuses to retire. Welcome to the end of our show. Do remember that Africa Good Morning is repeated on our One Up to website and our DSTV channel 285 and our Go TV channel 94 between 8.30 and 9 a.m. every weekday. I am Glenn Rashifura. And I am Diana Master, wishing you a lovely weekend ahead.